Well, your your fundamental criticism, and, and this is a- actually what I'm trying to pin down in our conversation, is that you're you're pointing to the misuse. It's like the dogmatic misuse of the traditions, as opposed to their proper use. So there's a scene in the Gospels. This is a very interesting scene. This is one of the things that gets Christ crucified, by the way, is that he accuses the Pharisees of being the same people who put the prophets upon which their faith is hypothetically predicated to death. Right, and so they don't take that insult kindly. But he's making the case, the same case you are, as far as I can tell, which is that it's possible to use the wisdom of the ages as a justification for the use of force. Let me give you another example of this. This is so cool. You tell me what you think about this. I just did this seminar in Exodus with a bunch of people. We released it on Daily Wire and on YouTube. And there's a scene in Exodus that's extremely extremely interesting. So Moses is put forward as the spirit that eternally delivers from tyranny and slavery. That's a good way of thinking about it. So you could imagine Mo- Moses as the embodiment of the force that wells up within you, that inspires you to speak out when the tyrants hold sway. And it's the same voice within you that calls you on your own slavish behavior. Anyways, Moses embodies that, and he's led his people in a rebellion against the tyrants, and now he's trying to lead them out of slavery. And they're in the desert while they're trying to work this out. That's one of those descents before an ascent, right? So they left tyranny, which was an inappropriate mode of organization. They fell into the desert, which is an intermediary period that's not the least bit pleasant, and they're heading for the promised land, right? Which is the next peak on the moral landscape, you might say. Now, Moses has been leading them along, you know, in a very admirable manner. And so this is what happens when they get onto the border of the promised land. So they're right there. They're still in the desert. They run out of water yet again. And God, Moses goes and talks to God and he says, you know, well, you've led us this far and we're right on the threshold of deliverance, so to speak, but we're out of water. And God says to Moses, tell the rocks, ask the rocks to bring forth water. And so he points out the rocks and then Moses goes over to the rocks, but instead of asking them, he hits the rocks with his staff. And his staff is a symbol of tradition, of tradition and authority. And it's it's the famous staff of Moses. And what he does is he commands, he uses force to compel the rocks to bring forth water instead of convincing them to do so verbally. And he is punished very severely for that because God tells him that because he used force, where he could have used the logos, he could have used linguistic communication. He can't enter, he'll die before he enters the promised land. And so it seems to me that your objection to the religious is fundamentally, given your belief in a transcendent good, given your belief in the reality of evil, given your notion that we do have an intrinsic directionality, given your idea that we need to believe in the the genuine existence of a moral landscape, is that your objection is in the, it's something like an objection to dogmatism per se. Yeah. Right? And then then we might ask ourselves, well, and that dogmatism is the willingness of people to use the tradition to what? To drive their own benefit? To to justify themselves without making the moral effort? Like, how do you think, how would you go about defining that inappropriate dogmatism? Right? It's also an attempt to make the ineffable fully comprehended, right? Because the thing about a religious totalitarian or a totalitarian of any sort is that the totalitarian will tell you that they have the truth in its final form, right? That's the really the totalitarian claim. So what is it about... What do you think characterizes that fundamental dogmatism? 
Well, first I, w- I would point out that it's only in religion that the the concept of dogma is uh, not a pejorative. In fact, I mean, in, in the Catholic context, it's explicitly a good thing. I mean, there's no embarrassment over the reliance on dogma. Um, I mean, it's a Catholic term. Uh, but everywhere else in our lives, we recognize that it is intrinsically divisive and not and incapable of tracking the truth. Right? But, but, I mean, something that's held dogmatically is something that is held, a belief that is held in spite of the fact that there's no good evidence for it, or in fact, in right in in, in but held why? opposition, but held why? No, but but I just want to I want to nail this particular point down because this is this is the crucial thing to to recognize in my view. We we understand in every other area of our lives that this is not um, that this is intellectually not only not pragmatic and not not helpful and not um, not playing by the rules. It's actually indecent, right? It's the antithesis of what we admire intellectually, right? When you it, to, immunity to counter evidence, no matter how compelling, is not a good thing um, intellectually and and ethically in any secular context, right? So if I say to you, "Listen, I believe X," and there's nothing you can say to convince me otherwise. And uh, mm-hmm. the more you, the, it, no, it, no, it, no matter how good your evidence gets, no matter how, how good your arguments get, um, I'm not, I'm not going to want to hear it. And if you press the case, I'm going to get angrier and angrier until if the, the possibility of, of, of having a conversation about anything fully erodes, right? That is the status quo with respect to religious sectarianism across the world. It has been that way for thousands of years. And it is still that way. Every Muslim, Christian, Jew, Mormon, Hindu, every every true religious person of any you know any denomination, to the degree that they really are truly religious, you know, and it's a faith based enterprise, has said in advance of any conversation on any topic. Listen, there are a few core things I believe, and that my children believe, and I have taught them to believe, and I don't want you meddling in any of that stuff. Right, and I'm going to get pissed off to the point of violence, or, or at least I will. I will be tolerant of the violence of my co-religionists if you push too hard on this particular door. The conversation is over where these core principles of faith start. Right? You're going to tell me you don't think Jesus is, was born of a virgin and will be coming back to raise the dead? I don't want to fucking hear it. Right? And and I and. That is our politics, even in America in the 21st century. We've got something like 45% of Americans who are sitting there on their Christian fundamentalism, right? Um, and yes, we can play nice on other topics that don't strike a tangent to those core beliefs. But when you really begin to push, when you really say, listen, mom and dad, when we educate your children in our school, we're going to be telling them things that is going to to make this this claim about the divinity of Jesus seem more and more spurious and more and more ridiculous and more and more at odds with everything we know about biology and engineering and everything else that we've learned in the last 2000 years and you are going to look like fools in the eyes of your kids for believing these specific dogmas right that's that's what's at stake here right and people feel it and they are resisting and they're resisting with medieval tools, right? Um, and and everything I just said about fundamentalist Christianity in, in America is much, much worse in the Muslim community in 100 countries, right? Um, you know, there's there's no comparison. There we're dealing with the Christians of the 14th century. Now, I'm not talking about all Muslims, but I'm, talk, I'm also not talking about just 1% of Muslims. We're talking about many, many millions of people who hold to their religious dogmas like it's a life preserver in a in a in a killing storm, right? And um, this is something we have to overcome. This we need a non sectarian conversation about the deepest ethical and spiritual and scientific truths that are available, and which is to say a non divisive one, one that is is truly open ended, where we're not not making adversarial recourse to to rival you know incommensurable claims from from centuries ago 
we're actually putting forward the best arguments and the best evidence in real time, resorting to all the best ideas that, that can be translated from every language instantaneously now. And it's, it's, a, it's a conversation very much in the spirit of science, very much in the spirit of medicine, say. And it's not to say that we, we have all that worked out. As you know, we just went through a global pandemic where people couldn't agree about what the hell was happening and whether vaccines are safe or good or worth, worth inventing, etc. But we know we, we can dimly see in that context where we need to go, and we, which is we need more evidence, more argument, better incentives, uh, an acknowledgement of what we don't know when we don't know it. Um, and we need, to, we need the conversation to simply continue. And we know when we look at it over our shoulder, we know we have made progress. We know we're not suffering, for the most part, you know, people being paralyzed from polio, right? Like we, we, like there was once a time where polio was was terrifying families everywhere, and for good reason. And now that is behind us, except for a few cases that have emerged of late because people are afraid of, of vaccines of all types. But we know it's possible to make progress in medicine, right? We know that progress is not a matter of half of our society saying. That they're going to stay put with the with the medicine of the of the seventh century or the first century BC, um, and so it has to be with ethics. So it has to be with spiritual experience. I mean, we're we're you know we're having this conversation in the context of a you know a short period of time where where uh, research on psychedelic drugs has come back after more than a generation of of, of ignoring the, the promise of these compounds. Um, who knows what possible benefits uh, exist if we if we explore that it, that technology and that research in the wisest and most uh, judicious possible way? We know there are possible. We know we can create immense harm by doing it badly. We know we we know in the '60s just broadcasting these these compounds onto the the population without any real safeguards was, um, you know, while I mean, some people's lives were improved, but, but many people were harmed too. And it was the thing to which the backlash of the last 40 years, um, uh, responded and there, and then we, we lost a, a more than a full generation of actually doing research on these compounds, but we're, we're only at the beginning of understanding what is possible for us individually and collectively as human beings. And, Understanding consciousness itself, not even just human consciousness, but consciousness as it is integrated with the physics of things, is is among the most important things we could do, and it's and it has implications for everything we're now touching. And 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 it, and the guidance is not going to come from the Bible, and it's not going to come from the, the the you know from Camelot either. It's like we we need new stories and new insights because we're confronting new things. I mean, like just take the take. We don't have to spend any time on it, but just I'll plant the flag here. Take artificial intelligence, right? If if we don't know how consciousness arises in this universe, and if we don't know whether or or when it arises on the basis of information processing, we are not going to know whether we build conscious machines, right? I think we're going to almost certainly we will build machines that seem conscious to us before we know whether or not they are conscious, and we will lose sight of. We, many of us will lose sight of whether it's, it's an even interesting problem to wonder whether or not they are conscious, right? They're going to pass the Turing test with such flying colors, special, especially when we're in the presence of humanoid robots that look human and that, that are, that are you know, truly general AI, that we're just going to treat them as conscious, helplessly, because we're going to, you're going to feel like a psychopath doing otherwise. And yet we're not going to know whether we've built machines that can suffer. Uh, and we're not going to know whether we're, we're committing a murder when we turn off a, a machine, et cetera. These are ethical problems that seem totally speculative until you imagine the possibility of, of inadvertently building machines that can suffer even more than human beings can suffer, right? That would be a monstrous thing to do, and that is a possible thing to do. Because, and it's something we, we might just stumble into by, by not knowing what we're doing in, you know, in informational terms. Um, so this is, a, this is all just to say that questions about the well-being of conscious creatures are questions that we need to address with all of the tools available in a way that is 
truly universal that gets that gets beneath the accidental differences of of uh, the, the a country the country of a person's origin. You know, you it, do, it doesn't it shouldn't matter where you were born or what what religion your parents were. That should that should not be the thing that constrains your thinking about the deeper truths here. And so, yes, if 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 I don't deny that the world's religions indicate something about the possibilities of human consciousness, past and present, and even the possibilities of a transcendent good to which we should all orient. But it's it's absolutely clear that we need a truly universal modern conversation about those truths that do, that that ultimately ignores sectarian cultural boundaries and 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 it's the sectarian cultural boundaries that i worry about